Those who've hung around here for a while know that I tend to preach on the gospel lesson for the morning. There are many reasons for that, I suppose. The gospels are where we learn most directly about Jesus, who is our best teacher about how to love God. That's why our liturgy makes a big deal out of reading from the gospel. It's announced by a deacon, read from a different location, gets a procession of its own. All these things are meant to say, listen up. What you're about to hear is especially significant. It's Jesus you're about to hear from. So I'm sure that's one reason why I gravitate toward preaching on the gospel text. Maybe it's also habit. And maybe I'm just a sucker for a good story, which I am, and the Gospels are stories about Jesus. But this morning, I'm breaking set. St. Paul's words to the Christians in Rome, to the believers in the very heart of the empire, are too rich to pass up. They fairly sing off the page, and I just couldn't ignore them. Last weekend, Heather Stevens led a terrific poetry writing workshop that I was grateful to attend. And one of the things we commented on is that sometimes choosing what you won't say is as important as choosing what you will say. I said that it's a lot like that with preaching, at least for me. You can't say everything, and you can't dig into all the lessons or say everything you want to about just one of them. So, this week, I'm narrowing it down to the epistle. I'll get a stab at Jeremiah and the Psalm and Matthew next go round. One commentator said that there's no way anyone could preach a single sermon on this entire section of Romans, that you could spend a whole year unpacking it. He may be right, but I'm going to give it a go anyway. All of you will have to be judge of whether or not my attempt was misguided. To understand what St. Paul is saying to us this morning, it helps to do a bit of a rewind. Knowing what he said last week, and really throughout his whole letter, helps make sense of what he's saying this morning. Paul had been summing up what he'd said about all that God has done for us in Christ. All the mercy, forgiveness, reconciliation, love that God had given to the believers to whom he was writing. Therefore, he said, because of all that, he said, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. In other words, offer your whole self to God. Paul is describing there the new life in Christ that they have now received. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And why? So that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then his beautiful metaphor that says, we are a single organism, living a life that by definition can only be lived together. For as in one body we have many members, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one of another. We're so used to hearing these words that it's easy to forget just how remarkable they really are. And I believe that for those of us who grew up in the midst of American culture, with all its insistence on rugged individualism, this is an especially difficult notion to grasp. What we're used to seeing ourselves, we're used to seeing ourselves as discrete, separate beings who sometimes come together, yes, but who remain separate even when we do that. If you're a Christian in other parts of the world, this is not so much of a stretch. Some of you will remember when Archbishop Desmond Tutu introduced to many of us the notion of Ubuntu, which is a very different notion of how we are connected. In that vision of the world, the connection is the starting place, not the separateness. It can be translated as, without you, 
There, with, there is no me without you. Which means that what any of us do impacts all the rest of us. We're inherently one. Now, this week, Paul is continuing his train of thought, describing the marks of a true Christian, the characteristics that he believes are God's will for our lives. And it is our lives, plural, because our lives are properly understood as being one, as he's just pointed out. His verbs are plural verbs. The Greek version of y'all, not you, singular. And they're imperatives, commands. They are not mere suggestions. You might want to live like this if you happen to get around to it. No, they are the demands of Christian life being lived the way God intends. Listen to all these verbs piled up staccato like one right after the other. Actions, all of them. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality, not just to each other, but to strangers. The word Paul uses here for hospitality literally means love of stranger. Let love be genuine. Let it be anti-hypocritical, is what it says literally. And then a whole list of what love looks like in actual day-to-day -day life. It's as though Paul has created a header called love and then an entire drop-down menu of how it's made manifest in a community. This kind of genuine love is not something we achieve once, but a virtue we seek that's enacted through daily practice and prayer. We don't talk much about virtues these days, but that's what Paul is describing a kind of character trait that's built into the warp and woof of who we are, how we live. Instilling virtues involves practice in both senses of the word. Practice, as in an activity, something you do, not just think or feel. And practice, as in it takes practice, takes intentional repetition until it becomes automatic. The challenge, of course, is to make a choice to love in every circumstance we encounter. And that gets hard. Paul begins with the immediate circle of the body of Christ. But then he begins to widen the circle. We are to love the saints, the Christians who are beyond simply St. Mark's, those across the diocese, across the nation, around the world. Next, Paul mentions those needing hospitality, any and all who need a welcome, an invitation to come in and be served and loved. Who in Durango needs a welcome? Who has not yet found a place where they can be cherished and encouraged? I have a hunch that we'll find plenty of folks with whom to practice welcome and hospitality next weekend at our Pride Festival booth. And then our pilgrimage to the border in November will have many things to teach us about welcome and hospitality if we keep our hearts and minds open. Next, Paul mentions our enemies. And here we need even more practice. Bless those who oppose you, don't curse them. It's what Jesus himself has taught his disciples. This is perhaps love at its hardest. We don't naturally move toward kindness and openness when we're feeling threatened or challenged or attacked. And that's really Paul's point, isn't it? We don't do it naturally. But in Christ, he says, we are new, transformed people. 
It's what he's been saying throughout his letter. Through God's mercy, the Spirit has been poured into your hearts. It's the Spirit who prays in you when you have no words left to pray. It's the Spirit who renews your minds, makes you whole, gives you a new start every single morning. And we are not simply new transformed people, but a new transformed people, a new community. It's as if Paul is saying, don't try this on your own. It won't work. You need each other to practice with, to learn how to address conflict maturely and lovingly, to learn how to persevere in prayer by having others pray with and for you, to learn compassion as you share your joy and your tears with each other. And I bet if we asked him, Paul would say that learning love is a lifelong endeavor, that there are always new lessons to learn, new places to draw the circle wider, that we should draw it so wide it encompasses all of creation, a kind of love we've been late to learn. What Paul most definitely says is that this place we call St. Mark's is to be a school for love, a place where we try and fail and try again to be the people God in Christ has made us, to love like God loves us. So look around you this morning. Really see your fellow students. Last week, we blessed the backpacks of those beginning a new academic year. But now, this morning, remember that school is already in session and always will be. Recognize that all of us are students together, that we've been given to each other to practice with and learn from, that the lessons are ongoing, and that if we learn well, we'll change not just ourselves, but the world. School's in session, my friends. Let's keep learning. Amen.